I'm, as far as tribal affiliation, I'm Laguna Pueblo from New Mexico. I was born in Albuquerque. And I'm Crow from Montana. And I've lived both on, on my Pueblo and on my reservation. But I've spent most of my adult and professional life in Sacramento. And, uh, and I will say that because I always have to honor that the tribes in um, California really have allowed me and taught me everything I know, which is just about that much in working in Indian country. Um, but I want to go ahead and get started before I turn it over to the main part, which is Carlos's piece. And on your agenda, it says, what is working for us? And I know that that's the, the title of the session for each one of the ethnic specific um, audiences. Um, but I changed it. I took the question mark off the what, it, what is working for us and say, what is working for us? And so that's really what I would like to uh, talk a little bit about before I t tell that, because Carlos is actually going to present on an evidence-based practice that is very, that is working well and is, has moved for, you know, a couple of decades across Indian country. Um, but I wanted to uh, touch on just a couple of things. And, um, okay, so as I'm thinking, looking at this, what we're talking about is culturally informed healing and prevention, and it's ceremony. It's not a curriculum. Uh, it's not a workshop, but it's ceremony. Because if you look at ceremony, ceremony is, that, is always about you were at one place as a child or as a single person. And as you went through that puberty ceremony, or you went through that marriage ceremony, then you had new roles and responsibilities. You could not go through it. You were not supposed to go through it and be the same as when you went in. And so if we're looking at um, curriculum, especially culturally, culturally driven uh, curriculum, it really should be ceremony. We should be changed by it. And so the next, so you've seen this, evidence-based practice, practices that integrate the best research evidence. I'm always thrown off by that best in there. And, um, and because that's not necessarily what we experience. And then there's the, then there's the definition for practice-based evidence, which uh, Carlos will be presenting on. But I like to put this visual up when I'm talking about um, practice-based evidence or cultural-based because it is pictures of containers. And these are containers from different cultures. Some of these containers I actually own and uh, have been given to me. Some have been given by people that I've, in communities I've worked with. Some have been given me by dancers who represented spirits and, uh, and prayers. And so they brought, so the pottery was given to me by, by a spirit during a dance. Uh, the, the woven, uh, when I was presenting this curriculum in Guam, because they saw the, uh, the curriculum and they say, ah, that speaks to us. Can you come and do a training of facilitators? Can you help us kind of weave that together? And so that's there. But there's also a bark, uh, a bark uh, container. There's also a black ash. And here, this one is, is corn. It's, it's a, uh, it, it's wo you know, the woven corn, uh, corn husk bag. What I'm going to ask you for the audience is what is the same about these containers? What is a commonality about these containers? Pardon me? Definitely, they are handmade. They're handmade and they're also made from the resources that were in their land, that were in their geography, so that the Pueblos would go down to the river, the river quarries, and get the clay, and they would form it. And for baskets, they're gonna go and they're gonna gather, they're gonna gather the grasses, and they are going to form it with their hands. And, and they tend to be really flexible. They're flexible, and, 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 and they, they're designed to be flexible. 
because they carry precious things. And so they're gathered from what is natural. They're gathered from what surrounds them. They're flexible and they're often designed with um, things that are around them. Geographic flowers, you know, these are the mountains, the shape of mountains. And so as we look at those containers, um, they're really precious for those particular reasons. So one of the reasons Native people have survived very long is because we're like water. We're like water in that we can shape to a container. And so we've had really flexible containers, but what has kept us over, over the genocide, over all of the government policies, is if we were given a container, we just like, okay, that's an, you know, that's our RFP. We will respond to it like we will, but once we start putting it together, we're going to shape it too, you know? And then we do what we know works. We do what we know works, but often those are those things, and we're always shaping to con a container. And um, but it's kept us alive. It's kept us our the songs that the bird singers are singing. You know the dances they're still going because we're like water. And um, so when we look at um, when we looked at evidence-based practice, you know it's like a tin can sometimes, or it might feel like a tin can. You know that there isn't the flexibility when you talk about um, when you talk about uh, the uh, having to reproduce something. You know, there's often no flexibility, and that's what we struggle with in our communities. If you say, "Ah, you must take a, use an evidence-based practice," and then to be able to take it and then try to fit ourselves into that. And I met with um, Eduardo Duran just last week, and he gave me a, peep, a, a paper on science, story science. And I wanted to just read, even though I know you can read. He said terms like multiculturalism, competency, and sensitivity have been overused in research and clinical practice in counseling and psychology. As long as these terms are defined by epistemology that is not from the community under investigation, the practice of research will be merely one of ongoing neocolonialism. And I thought that was really key because it is, you're, you're working with a tin can. And I think that what this conference is about is how not, not that we adjust to the can, which has kept, kept us you know, alive in our culture, but how do we shape that can? How do we shape that can? And I think that's, you know, that we were talking about lunch. It's time to quit adjusting to the container, but to begin to shape that container. And so one of the things that we've done that was with the gathering of Native Americans. And the gathering of Native Americans has certain components. And some of you might have been aware because SAMHSA, 20 some years ago during the, uh, the community partnerships, anybody around long enough so that there was a Sam, aha, the, uh -huh, okay, there she. And so GONA, the gathering of Native Americans came out as a part of that, but also the API developed a curriculum yeah, an institute, they called them institutes. The IAM was the African American Institute, and then there was the Healy, which was the, which was the Latino Hispanic. And so the GONA, and we wouldn't use the word institute, <laughs> we said it's a gathering, it's a gathering of Native Americans. And 21 years later, we're still doing the GONA in, in Native community. And the reason I feel like we're doing that is because it started with prayer, just as like we started today. It started with that spiritual base. But it continues to use much of what you've seen this today is it has ceremony, ritual, prayer, and song. It sets that stage. It tells stories, and the stories are both traditional stories, they're historical stories, and they're personal transformation stories that are told during that one day to four day. The original was four days. And it has many teaches about historical trauma, cultural oppression, and lateral oppression, how we treat each other today as a result of that trauma. But there's also experiential exercises because some of us learn by doing and to play and to be involved. And it has icebreakers and energizers. And then we process that about what it means today. 
And so that curriculum's around 22 years later. Two, two weeks ago, I was in Shinnecock, uh, which was the, the very you know, tip of when uh, col colonialism on Long Island. And we did the Gona there. And it was still relevant because it has these components to it. Um, so when I look at what stages, if you look at evidence, if you look, and I use, I quote uh, from Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman, and she says, these are the things that need to be in place. And art started with one. What did art said, said that needed to be in place for, for healing to begin? Do you remember Art Martinez? The, to stopping the trauma. You have to be safe. And so in uh, Dr. Herman's, she's, you know, she's looking at uh, recovery and trauma. She said, you have to establish safety. The first thing you need to do is for people to be safe. The second thing is that there needs to be a remembrance and a mourning, is we have to tell our story of trauma. We have to see this is what happened to us, and we have to mourn that. We have to mourn our story, to grieve our story, because often the ways that we grieved were the things that were, were um, oppressed. The healers, the ceremony, all the things that moved us through ceremony were not there. So when we go back and heal from trauma, we have to tell that historical trauma story, even though often we'll say, oh, we don't hear that. They're going to talk about historical trauma. You know, get over that already. We need to say that to hear. We have to hear ourselves say it, and we have to change that story, the remembrance and mourning. And then we have to reconnect and be empowered. We have to reconnect to community, and then we have to reconnect to family, and then we ha and then we can move fo forward with empowerment, that advocacy, whatever it might be. And so, as I looked at that, and I thought, oh, I recognize that. I'm reading it, and it makes sense. But it's exactly what Gona does. What we do in in the first theme of of Gona is belonging. We create safety. We build community. We talk about healthy norms. In mastery, that's where we really look at what is our strength, but what happens so that we don't know how to grab hold of it anymore. So we look at remembrance. We tell that historical trauma story. And then we mourn it. We have ceremony. We talk about grieving stories, traditional stories that told us that we used to have seasons of mourning. Not that week you get off because someone passed away in your family. OK, come back next week and be just as, you know, <laughs> you're ready to go back to work. But our story said we had seasons. We had that year. We set ourselves aside. And so we're reminded that in the story. And that happens in mastery. And then the third theme is interdependence, that we recognize that we're connected to community, that we belong together. And that happens, so as part of that reconnecting is what um, Herman says, ah, we need to reconnect. We do that in Gona. And then the, the, our, our fourth theme of Gona is generosity. After all of that, knowing we belong, done our story and mourned our story and know we're connected, then we have to give back. That generosity is giving back. That's empowerment. That's advocacy. And so we knew that. Without going through that, when we developed curriculum in our communities, we already knew that. Oh, this is what we do. This is what we do to heal. And I wanted to say that because that's what I say to Native communities, because they have to be grounded about this is why Gona works. This is exactly what we're saying, you know, that science says heals trauma. And we're already doing it. And we've been doing it not only the 20 years of the curriculum, but we knew that built on and on. And so I wanted to share that with you. Um, it is because we need to be reminded, as you've been all day, about the wisdom. And this is just an example. So we're here reclaiming medicine. We're reclaiming that medicine. And over here, if you look at the very top, that's tobacco. For many tribes, that's the first thing that was given was tobacco. And that was to pray with. You know, to pray with, the same as a burnt tortilla, you know. <laughs> you know, so that, um, so sending that smoke up, very sacred. But what has happened, again, it's been put into a container. That's skull container. That's a skull, skull boxes there. 
you know, so that sacredness then has put into this skull container, you know, that people will use. And, um, and so it's that, that it, again, the importance of not being contained is key. And then as I was looking at this, I thought, but you know how powerful indigenous people are? Is that even when we're put into a container, we shape it. We can turn it full circle back to medicine. And so if you're from the community, you might know about jingle dress dancers. And the jingle dress came as a healing dance that, um, that a grandpa dreamed because his granddaughter was dying. And he went and he dreamed and he was asked for the medicine for his granddaughter. And he was given, told that they should dance this dance. And what people have done with the skull lids <laughs> is they take them off and they make cones out of them. They're twisted into cones. And if you ever go to a powwow, a ceremony, and you see the jingle dress dancers and you hear them dancing, it is because they have these cones, metal cones, which are the lids of those cans, and they've turned them back into medicine. And so over here, you have some of those dancers there. And I guess what I'm saying is that we do have the power to shape those containers. Um, we have done that, and we must continue to do that, you know, to shape whatever has been canned and then look at how do we make it so then it comes medicine again. And, um, and I think that's a good example as far as jingle dress dancers. And so I wanted to share that story with you. And there was just a picture, how skull has become medicine again. And these dancers that are here, they are dancers from Toronto because there was about 600 native women that disappeared and it was never investigated never investigated uh, by the Canadian government about why. And then actually the United Nations came in and were willing to do, and this was I think three years ago. And these women that are here with their jingle dresses came out and they were of all ages that came out in their jingle dresses and they, in the cold, because if you see the video, you could tell they're cold, they're hugging each other. But they wanted to come out and dance when the United Nation investigator came to greet him in their healing dresses. And so you can actually see that, like on, on, on YouTube. They're all out and they started to dance. And to me, that's reclaiming that medicine. And so I wanted to share that story because we really are. This, this, if we move, if this, if this conference becomes ceremony, then we just don't walk out of here as if it was another event that we went to and wrote a report on, is that we take forward and we use it and it becomes ceremony. And so with that, I want to introduce Carlos Rivera. He's from the Sacramento Native American Health Center. And, um, and he has a transformation story that he's going to share. But I just want to say this, because Carlos, to me, is a really uh, um, amazing counselor and, and um, a facilitator throughout Indian country. And so he works in Sacramento, but he travels throughout uh, the nation where he's called, um, introducing and teaching people to do the White Bison curriculum, which is, that, which is a really community-driven um, uh, curriculum. And so I'm going to let uh, Carlos talk about that. You Thank you, Barbara. That, you can change that. Okay. So Brent is going to help me uh, get set up with my PowerPoint. He's already back. <clears throat> After a couple <laughs> tries of not being able to, to play my uh, digital story and another short video that I had. Um, but uh, that's, it's meant to be that way. And so um, I want to introduce myself. Uh, Barbara, um, you know, she uh, s explained a little bit. But um, I have to explain where I, where I come from, you know, my, my heritage, my my people. It's very important. I was taught um, that when I introduce myself, I introduce myself um, by my tribe. Because I never know who's in the room. I might have uh, a, you know, a fellow tribal member here or a tribal uh, relative you know, from, a, from a neighboring tribe. And so uh, I come from um, the Pomo Nation. That's, uh, we come from Sonoma County, Mendocino County. So we're, uh, we're along the north, northern coast of California. And uh, we were actually, um, my, my people, we actually lived uh, on the coast, on the ocean. And, uh, but when settlers came in um, years ago, they pushed our people back into the valleys. And so now we have um, about 22 different tribes of, of my tribe, right, bands, 
were spread out in the valley um, from Sonoma County all the way up to um, Fort Bragg. And, uh, and that heritage comes from um, my grandma and my grandpa's side, my mom's side. And, um, and on my dad's side, um, my dad was born in uh, central Mexico, a state called uh, Zacatecas. And uh, that's where he was born. He was raised there till he was about 18 years old. And um, him and his uh, <clears throat> uncle and, uh, and a cousin, um, they walked from central Mexico all the way to um, California. Took them, uh, you know, took them a long journey to, to make it here. But, but my dad came here with one mission, and that was to come and make a living and help his dad back home. See, because he, he, um, he was raised by his dad. His, he wasn't raised by his mother. And, um, and again, um, you know, growing up, Growing up, I, I knew that I was, you know, half, you know, Mexican or Latino, and then I also knew that, okay, I'm also Pomo Indian. But that's pretty much all I knew. I didn't know anything else other than that, you know. Um, and so growing up, I, I really struggled with trying to find out, and I didn't even know this was happening. I didn't know this was happening, but I was trying to find out where I belong and where do I fit in. Where do I fit in? Because I see a lot of other things going on around me, and I, and I found myself trying to be that and really not knowing who I am inside here. You know? And so, um, so that's a part of my story. That's a part of my story. So what, we're, what we've talked about you know, yesterday and today about evidence-based practice and, and what works, right? Well, um, oh, I'll come, I'll come up in a minute, yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Well, um, what, I wanna, what I wanna say is that um, I know it works because it worked with my life, okay? I have to share that this year on November 1st, I celebrate 11 years of sobriety, you know? And, and I'm, not, I'm not afraid to acknowledge that, you know? Where I, that where I am today, a lot of things had to happen before I got here, you know? And so I know that like programs like the Gona, programs like White Bison, I know that those programs work. I know that they work because they worked in my life, you know? And that's, the, that's all the evidence I need, <laughs> you know? I don't need the government or anyone else to tell me that, you know, we need numbers to show that, you know? I know it works. And so I was, um, well, let me make my way, my way up here, let's see. So I got some, some images here. You guys here? Okay. So I'm going to do my best to work this PowerPoint. Tap that, tap that button on the mic. Down the base where it says push. Okay. Pretty much. Come on. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Good. So I want to, um, I want to start out by saying again that I was, uh, I was raised by my grandmother, uh, my grandmother on my, on my Indian side, and she raised uh, four, four of us. Um, my mom spent um, about 20 years in and out of prison. Um, you know, she, deal, she struggled with her own, her own uh, addictions and her own trauma that, um, you know, at, at that time, none of us knew what, what it was. We didn't even know what trauma was, but that was just kind of what was unfolding. And, um, and my dad had um, went back to Mexico, um, you know, for, for about 10 years. And so, so during the time that my grandmother, my grandmother was raising me, she tried her best, she did her best to, to give us what we needed. But of course, there was a lot of things that we needed, a lot of things that we needed that, um, that we didn't get, you know. And, um, and one thing that I'm gonna talk about today in my story that I, didn't, I haven't heard yet, and you know, I've sat through different presentations and different discussions all morning and even last night in circles, but I'm gonna talk about uh, sexual abuse, you know, something that, um, you know, as a, as a man, you know, that even at one point that was very, very difficult to talk about. But that's a part of my story. <clears throat> when, I, when I was seven years old, um, my grandmother's uh, brother, her, her younger brother, um, sexually abused me. And the way he, that, that this happened, um, you know, it traumatized me for a very, very long time. I remember the story very clearly, you know, how he had used... Um, uh, religion, you know, to do this. And I remember one evening I, I, I was at his, um, his apartment and, um, and I remember on the, on the wall of his, uh, of his room there was, a, there was a picture, a drawing, right? There was a drawing of a, of a man on a horse, a white horse. 
And I didn't have a face, but he had like this, this ray of sunshine, sunlight. And I had, um, I looked over and I, and I asked, um, I'd asked my uncle, I said, what's that, what's that picture of, you know? And he says, oh, that's Jesus Christ. He's going to come back and save you, you know? And uh, right when he had said that, I started to cry. Tears started to come down my eyes. And then he had asked me, he said, what's wrong? And I, and I was thinking about my mom. I said, well, who's going to save my mom? Because she's in prison, you know? And I had, I had believed in what he had told me so strongly that I had thought that, that um, if I go to heaven, where's my mom going to go? I'm never, ever going to see her again. And that just broke my heart. It broke my heart. And then that night was the very first night that my uncle sexually abused me. And then I didn't share that for the next 20 22 years with anyone, not even in my drunkest moments, not even in those moments when I felt most like I'm sharing my heart, right? Not even in those moments I shared that because somewhere along that way, somewhere along my path, I got the message that I don't talk about this stuff. I don't share it with anyone and I definitely don't cry about it, you know? And so I stuffed it inside for many, many, many years so I think about things like that, that impacted me and that, that hurt me. But there was one other event that hurt me more than even that situation, if you can believe that. And that was when, when I was taken away from my grandma by the, by the courts. So you see, I talked about being sexually abused and then, and then, I mean, that's traumatic as we get, right? We talk about those things today. But being taken away from my grandma was even more traumatic for me. That day that happened, my life changed forever. I never was the same again. And I spent, I spent the next 10 years, maybe 15 years running, always trying to make it back to her. See, something died inside of me that day. And out of that hurt and out of that pain, I became very angry. I became suicidal, I became homicidal at the age of 12 years old. And, land, and my decisions landed me in the juvenile hall system until I was 18 years old. In and out. Because I didn't know what was going on, I, I just knew that, that I hurt and that I was angry. You know? And so I developed these belief systems based off of, off of what, what, I, what, I, um, what I heard, what I saw growing up. Okay, and and it and it hurt me. You know. So I'm gonna jump forward a little bit because I mean we know the stories we hear every every day from the people that we work with, right? Our communities. I mean my story is no different from the next kid, you know. And what I know is that at my lowest of my low, when I was at the bottom, and here I am, a grown man now, you know, out living on the streets, homeless you know, strung out on, on methamphetamine and alcohol, and I didn't know what else to do. And my mind, I thought my mind was gone. I thought I was, I thought I was crazy. And so I remember one evening in 2004, I got on my knees and I made a prayer. And I made a prayer. And in this prayer, I didn't know who I was praying to, but I had said, if anybody's listening, and I mean this with, my, with, with everything that I have left, I'm going to say this prayer that if you give me one chance to change my life, I will change my life and I will give my life to you. And from that moment, what I was told is that I took one step to the spirits, and in return, the spirits took 10 steps to me. And they have been guiding me ever since. They have been guiding me ever since. So I entered a residential program shortly after. I entered, uh, entered a residential program for Native Americans. And I heard about this program because I knew family members that had went there at one time. And I remember when they came back home, they came back with this shine. They're, I mean, you could just tell that they were happy, you know? And I remember seeing them because at those moments when I would see them, I was using. You know, and I was like, oh, you know, like, I hope, I, maybe, hopefully I get that one day, you know. And so I get to this program, and for the very first time, I learned that, that being Native American is more than just the tribe, what your name is, you know. I learned about spirituality for the very first time. 
I learned about these gifts of the sacred hoop. Forgiven the unforgivable. When I say forgiven the unforgivable, right, I think about my uncle. Uh, you know, I, that was my story at one time. I will never forgive that guy. Matter, as a matter of fact, when I see him, I'm going to kill him. That's what I told myself before, you know. Now, if this is hard to believe, but I, I was able to find forgiveness for those things that happened. You know how I was able to find that forgiveness is because I know that people who hurt, they were hurt at one time. So I know something happened in his past too, right? So just by that knowledge, just by that knowing, I was able to step out of my own belief system and say, you know, all right. I'm not letting him off the hook for what he did to me. I'm letting myself free from that pain and that trauma. You know? First time I learned about healing, going into, going into some of our sacred ceremonies, going into the sweat lodge, and experiencing what that feels like. You know? Hope. Today I know, and I'm the only person in my family, I can honestly say this, that I'm the only person in my family that is in recovery today. And I know that, that every day that I stay clean and sober and that I stay on this path, every day I give them hope. Maybe one day, just maybe one day, They'll come around and they'll ask, okay, how do you do it? Man, you've been doing this for a long time now, you know? Because I remember when I was younger and I would see my mom and other people would go programs and they would leave and come out and, and they would end up relapsing and using. I was like, that's, you know, that doesn't work. That program doesn't work. I thought it was just part of this is, this is what's going to happen when I grow up. I'm going to go to jail, I'm going to go to prison, I'm going to go to a program, and I'm going to get out and then do it all over again. And then you do it long enough, and then finally you get the respect that you wanted. That's what I thought life was about. <laughs> but I just didn't know, you know. Learned about unity in this program. I learned for the first time that, that in order for me to maintain this way of life, that I need to do some things, and I need people to help me. I need people to help me. I need my aunties to help me. I need my uncles to help me. You know. <clears throat> it was the very first time where I felt like I belonged. Because you remember, coming from these different worlds, I didn't know where I fit in. You know, even living in Mexico for some time, you know, even being down there, not really feeling like I'm a part of, you know, that community. Because in their eyes, I was American. <laughs> that's what they would call me. Oh, see, sí, el, 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 el americano. That's who, you know, that's the way they, they called me. And then even on my native side, like the, the relatives from the res, they would come down and, and, um, and they would, you know, in drunken moments, you know, you're not Indian. You're not Indian, you know, because I'm half, you know, Mexican. So I remember feeling all that, you know, and I would just keep it stuffed inside. I wouldn't say anything. And then it wasn't for that first time I, where I felt like I belonged. Where, and it was natives from all across the country. All across the country. There were, there were natives from Arizona, New Mexico, South Dakota, Washington. They came from all over. And, and they, they made me feel like I belonged there. You know? And so I said, oh, this is, this is what healthy natives look like. <laughs> I didn't know what they looked like. <laughs> And, and it was beautiful, you know, it was beautiful. An elder told me once, he's like, you're, the, you know, you relatives with, with different tribal backgrounds, different races, different heritage, you guys are special people. He says, because you guys can go into different camps, like very easily. You could go into different camps and make peace here, make peace there. You know, and I never thought about it that way, like, oh yeah, you know. I got bloodlines that go all the way down into Zacatecas, you know? And I could go there and I got family there and people that will love me and accept me, you know, and just kind of take, take me in. And then I could go up north back to my, to my land and I got, you know, I got homes up there where I feel like I'm at home, you know? But see, nobody's teaching us, our young people this, you know? And so I, that's what I do today. I teach our young people, you know? You guys are special. Look at it that way, you guys are very spe special and unique. 
So the Red Road, um, it's a it's a teaching that has been around for, gosh, I mean, since the early 1900s, I would say, you know, and it was, I think it was first quoted by a, a medicine man by the name of Black Elk, Black Elk. And so from his teachings, we were able to, a lot of other relatives who uh, still do the work today, like Don Cohis, for example, they were able to take these teachings and develop it into something, you know, bigger. Don Cohis is the founder of White Bison. Don Cohis um, founded uh, White Bison in 1987. See, Don was a uh, NASA engineer, all right? He worked on that project that, that took the, the shuttle to the moon for the very first time. He was one of those engineers that worked on that project. But what, what a lot of people didn't know was that Don was an alcoholic. You know, and so, so I think about this old prophecy from the Hopi people. There's a Hopi medicine man said that one day, the indigenous people of this country are going to enter a time of healing when an eagle flies around the moon. When an eagle flies around the moon. So during this time, right before that shuttle leaves Earth and goes to the moon, the lead people to this program they had asked those scientists, you know. Hey, I want you guys to uh, put something on this shuttle because we're making history today, you know? And so, you know, some scientists, they came and they, they put pictures of their family, maybe their children, maybe some other important items that meant something to them. Well, Don puts an eagle on that shuttle. <laughs> and, and that shuttle goes to the moon, makes its journey to the moon. Now, when it attempted to land on the very first time, it couldn't land because of weather conditions. So that shuttle had to circle the moon for the very one full circle. All right? And then when it landed, what were those words that were said? The eagle has landed. Right. So when that eagle landed on the moon, it kicked up dust. You know, it kicked up dust. And what happened was it, it sent a shock wave through the universe. And it woke up the, the spirits of our people. See, that, that, that shock wave was so powerful that it woke up the spirit of our people. And we begin to rise again. So now you think about it, right? That happened in the 60s, right? Now you think about the 70s and maybe even in the 60s. Think about all those movements that took place. All the movements that started to happen. The occupations. You know, all these powerful movements. The AIM movement, American Indian movement. You know, the, the African-American movements, all of these movements, that wasn't no accident. That, that happened for, for, a, for a reason. It wasn't no coincidence either, you know. So then Don, he, he leaves NASA, and, um, and he gets deeper into his alcoholism. And one night, he explains it this way. He explained this to me. One night, I, I, I was suicidal. I wanted to kill myself. So the, he, he, he lived in Colorado Springs at the time, and that's actually where our office is. So our White Bison Institute, or Wild Bridey Institute, is in Colorado Springs. And so he was living there at the time. So, he, so Don says, you know, I was feeling suicidal. I wanted to kill myself. I grabbed my guitar and a, and a bottle of Jack Daniels, and I went to Garden of the Gods. Now, Garden of the Gods is a very sacred place to Native people. Um, you know, this was like historically, natives would come from all over and they would go to this place and they would make prayers and have ceremonies. Well, the Don had went there and uh, he wanted to kill himself. So he started to climb this rock and he fell. Don fell, he broke his bottle of Jack Daniels, he broke his guitar. <laughs> and now he's, he's upset. He gets up and he, he kicks the, you know, he kicks rocks. And he's cursing, you know, like, man, I can't even do this right. <laughs> so he goes home. He forgets about that he wants to kill himself, and he goes home. The very next day, an elder, an elder comes to visit him. And he doesn't even know this elder. He doesn't even know, never seen this elder before in his life. This elder walks in. And so Don invites him into his house. And... Uh, and he sits him down, and he gives him, like, coffee and offers him something to eat. That's, traditionally, that's what we do. You know, we invite, invite our relatives in and, and give them the best. 
So this elder began to talk to him and said, you know what, you're going to do some things. You're going to do some things. And Don's like, I don't know what you're talking about. So you're going you're gonna to make some changes. You know? And so from that, from all of that, white bison was, was born. The well Brady movement was born. And, and in well there there's, there's a lot to well -brighty. So we think about sobriety, right? Sobriety. Sobriety is about being sober, being, being clean. And that's good. That's what we want. But we also want well -brighty. Because I want to be a well person, too. I want to be clean. I want to be sober. I want to be happy. I want to be at peace. I want to be able to understand why I feel the way I feel. Treat other people with respect and love. You know, experiencing these emotions for the very first time. I want, I want that. And so that's how Wall Bridey was, was created, you know. So White Bison offers um, about 12 different teachings. And I travel across the country to different reservations, and I, uh, and I, t and I teach this, these teachings, this curriculum, to, uh, you know, providers that work with Native American communities, Native American kids. I have a passion for working with Native American youth, specifically the ones that are in the juvenile hall system. You know, um, that's where my heart is. And in these teachings, they're, they're three-day trainings, three-day teachings. And right, you know, we call them trainings and stuff, but really they're, they are a ceremony because when we when we start, we start in a circle. We start in a circle like this talking circle. I was taught that in a talking circle. We always invite creator. You know, however you want to call your higher power, but we invite creator into the circle. Because when we invite creator into the circle, we cannot go wrong. I was taught that I have to invite the sense of belonging into the circle, that we're all equal, that I might be open in the circle and, and leading it, but we're all equal here. You know? And then I was taught that I have to in invite the sense of trust into this circle. See, the talking circle is a healer. I, I look at it that way. The talking circle heals. You know, once that circle begins and that feather starts to get passed around, it starts to create a healing energy and things happen in the unseen world. We can't see it though, but it's happening. I talked, I talked briefly earlier about sweat lodge ceremony. This is one of our purification ceremonies that, uh, that I'm still learning about. I'm still learning about it. You know, I, I participate in this ceremony twice a week you know, when I'm not traveling. Sometimes when I'm traveling, I go to reservations, they offer that too. And so I, I make sure to, if I feel safe, I make sure to, to uh, participate in that. But this is, a, um, this is a purification ceremony. So this ceremony here, we actually use this ceremony before we go into other ceremonies. So, so we are blessing ourselves, you know. Now a lot of people, you know, when I explain it to them, they, they say, oh, is it like a sauna? <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> it's a lot different than that. <laughs> but I get your point, though. I know what you're trying to, you know, how you're trying to relate it to. And, um, but it's about that spiritual connection. From the moment I walk into that door, I'm praying. From the moment I walk into that door, I crawl into the door, I'm praying. You know, and I don't stop praying until that fire is out, until that door is closed again for the last time, you know, until our next sweat. It's about the cultural identity. You know. I know now that I, I grew up in a world that is, is so, so big. I mean, more than I can describe, more than I can explain. But in this world, there's so many distractions. There's so many things that are attractive to the, to the eye, you know? So growing up, you know, you, you see things on TV, you hear things on music, and you want to be those things, you know? And for me, it's because, again, I didn't know who I was. So the way I, t the way I tell my story is that at one time, I lived out there in that world. I lived out there, and it, 
and it ran me over. I didn't understand it. I didn't know how to function in it. But today I live in this sacred hoop. I live in this sacred circle today. And in this circle, I have my culture, I have my spirituality, I have my elders. I have the things that work for me. And so there's nothing out there anymore that's attractive to me anymore. You know, I have it right here. You know. And it's because of my, my culture, it's because of our Native American teachings. So I talked about white bison. Um, I, I specifically um, train on white bison medicine wheel teachings, which is a combination of Native American culture with the 12-step model. You guys familiar with the 12-step model? Do you guys know that it, was from, it came from Native American teachings? <laughs> I got a great story about that, but I don't think I have time for it. So maybe afterwards I can share it with some of you if you want to, if you want to know about it. Um, but I also teach um, historical trauma and grief and loss uh, healing for Native American communities. And that's a curriculum that's called uh, Mending Broken Hearts. So we have a curriculum for adults and a curriculum for youth. We have Medicine Wheel for adults and Medicine Wheel for youth. And, uh, and so I, again, I, um, I'll be on the road. Um, next week, I believe, I'll be in Colorado Springs um, facilitating a Mending Broken Hearts training for um, Native counselors from all over the country. Native American drumming is uh, its a way of life for me. Um, I'm a part of different groups back home, and I get to travel, again, I get to travel the country singing and drumming at different, different communities. You know, it's not just something I do. It's not just something I do once a year and then put it away and then call it, you know, and do it next year. I do it. I do it all the time. And right now is what we call powwow season. It's it's uh, it's ceremony season. So every every weekend we got something going on. You know. <clears throat> and this group here, this is back at our clinic. And so around this circle are a lot of our um, our men who have come through the program, and they they've done the white bison twelve step medicine wheel. You know. Sometimes we have a strong group. Sometimes people graduate and they go on through, and it might be a couple singers, but. You know, but we keep it strong. I'm proud of these guys. We have a couple of our counselors that, that are in the, in the picture here as well. You know. This is important, a hundred drum gathering that was supposed to take place in 2010 that didn't happen because of a lot of reasons. Um, White Bison operates off of seasons and changes. And so I, th I believe in that 2010, um, Don, the way Don explains this is that we were in a season of uh, a winter. So there was a lot of struggle going on within the agency. And, um, and so last year in December, we had a meeting of all the trainers. There's six trainers for White Bison. And uh, we have two trainers that live up in Canada, which at this time we're, try we're actually in, in the process of opening up an institute in Canada because we have so many natives up there, First Nations people, who have suffered from boarding school. Yes. I mean, we're talking about this, this they, they were experiencing it up into the 80s. You know, when for us, you know, we, I mean, we, when, when did ours end, you know? I mean, as far as the actual institutions, right? So we're in the process of doing that. And then there's four trainers that live down here in, in, the, um, in the lower states, Minnesota, California. So last year we had our meeting and, um, and we have on the calendar that we're going to have this gathering next year, next year, September next year uh, in Minnesota. And so we're going to have 100 drums that are going to come together from different communities and they're all going to come and sing the same song at the same time to create one heartbeat. And that heartbeat, again, is going to pulsate and cross the universe. And we're going to enter a different time, a different season. So I just want to end with that. Thank you.